New audiobooks on our channel for free every week. Subscribe and click on the bell to not miss. Dale Carnegie How to Communicate Effectively with People Preface Communication is a two-way street. There are four and only four ways to establish contact with the outside world. We are evaluated and classified based on what we do, how we look, what we say and how we say it. Dale Carnegie These days, communication, that is, what and how we speak, has become a major success factor. All those who are called great leaders in any field are able to communicate effectively with people. It is absolutely not necessary that this skill is innate. Everyone can learn how to communicate correctly, if they only want to. All you need is will and perseverance. As a result, you will be able to present your ideas more effectively in front of your boss, colleagues, clients and even relatives. By learning to communicate more energetically, you will be able to inspire and motivate colleagues to turn a boring meeting into a dynamic exchange of opinions. Various misunderstandings constantly arise in daily communication. Professional jargon that is understandable within an organization may be completely incomprehensible outside of a given company or industry. This fact must be taken into account. A professional should be able to express his opinion clearly, concisely and confidently, especially in unforeseen situations that require courage, confidence, the ability to quickly organize, and then communicate his thoughts with confidence and conviction. Communication is not a one-way street. Contacting people does not just mean giving the listener a piece of information. Effective communication should be a two-way highway. It is impossible without constant feedback between the parties, each of which must be clear that its message is understood and accepted. To do this, it is necessary to ask questions, observe the interlocutor, and in case of misunderstandings, skillfully make corrections and make sure that they are understood. Following these rules, you will achieve several goals at once. Your messages will become clear and reach the addressee. The work will be carried out efficiently, on time and with fewer errors. The manager will have fewer problems and will be satisfied with his work. This book outlines a number of strategies for improving oral and written communication. These are the main steps to success. You will learn how to improve your oral speech skills, whether it is a normal conversation or a public speech in front of a large audience. Listen and be aware of what has been said, use body language and understand it, as well as clearly, both concisely and fully, express your thoughts in writing. To get the maximum benefit from this book, first read it in full so that you have a solid idea of the concepts and ideas presented here. Then reread each chapter separately and start applying the knowledge gained in practice. We hope that this book will teach you to communicate more confidently and effectively, thanks to which you will achieve success in all areas of your life. Arthur Pell Chapter 1 A Clear Statement of Thoughts Don was beside himself. I explained to him in detail how to do it. He said he understood, but he got it all wrong. Now he will have to start over. Has this ever happened to you? You gave detailed instructions to a subordinate, explained your idea to a colleague, explained the procedure to the client, being firmly confident that you were understood. But then it turned out that this was completely wrong. But many problems could be avoided if we learn to tell others exactly what we want. Is our message clear? What do you think? Don asked the subordinate after he instructed him to complete the task. That's right. The question sounded like this. Do you understand? And now guess what the subordinate replied, you're right again. Naturally, he said, yes, I understand. But to say I understood does not mean to actually understand. Sometimes people just think that everything is really clear to them. But if what is said is interpreted to the listeners not the way we want it, there can be no question of any understanding. Some understand only part of what has been said, but believe that everything is clear to them. And some do not understand anything at all, but they do not dare to tell the boss about it and try to figure it out themselves. In all these situations, effective communication does not occur, mistakes and misunderstandings occur, time is lost and, as a result, no work is done. How to express your thoughts correctly Betsy, the manager of the travel agency, 
never asks subordinates if they understand the task. Instead, she asks the subordinate to tell her what he will do. I'm taking an exam, Betty says. I explain the tasks to the employee, and then ask him to explain what he is going to do. And if a subordinate misinterprets my words, I immediately make adjustments, and not waiting for a problem to arise. If the project is complicated, I ask a number of questions. What will you do in case A? Imagine what happened B. Betty's responsibilities include training employees to work on a computer when ordering and selling air tickets. To be sure that the person is working correctly on the computer, and not only ask him questions, but also ask him to show how this or that operation is performed. Looking at how people cope with the task, I can determine what they have learned. Has our message been accepted? Understanding is the main criterion for good communication. But there is another, no less important factor. What has been said should not only be understood, but also accepted. The manager tells the employee that the task should be completed by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There is no doubt that the employee understood the task, but if she said to herself, nothing will work out, will it be completed on time? Hardly. If the person who does the work does not consider it really feasible, he will not try to meet the deadline. Louise, the owner and manager of the construction logistics company require employees to actively participate in projects. Having gathered people, she first of all tells them what is required of them and why it should be done by a certain time. Then Louise asks by what date, according to the employees, the task can be completed and what proposals will be made for its implementation. Sometimes, as a result of the discussion, it is possible to find an even more effective solution than was proposed at the beginning. And sometimes Louise realizes that it will take more time to complete the work than she expected. Employees know that their opinion will be heard and taken into account, so in difficult situations when additional labor and energy costs are necessary, Louise can count on their support. It is necessary to think over your words. Any message needs to be thought through, whether it's a speech in front of a group or one-on-one -on -one conversations. It happens that there is very little time to prepare, but in most cases we can not only think through our words, but also make preliminary sketches. Getting to know the topic at work communication usually proceeds along the lines of well-known issues. We are talking about the business and problems of the company. In general, about what we understand well. But sometimes we have to express our opinion about what we are not familiar with. For example, your company is planning to purchase a new computer program, and you are asked to check whether such a purchase is appropriate. Collect as much information on this topic as possible, ten times more than is required for the presentation. Write down all the pros and cons of the proposed purchase, decision, and so on. Regardless of whether you are preparing a report for your superiors or a speech for a group of technical specialists, prepare for answers to all questions. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so as not to miss the new items. Getting to know the audience. Even a specialist in the field of communication will not be able to convey his message to the audience if she is not able to understand what has been said. Therefore, it is necessary to know your audience and choose the right words so that everything is clear to people. Speaking to engineers, you can safely use technical terms. Otherwise, even if we are talking about technical problems, you should not use special terms. If the audience is unable to understand your words, the message will simply be lost. Those who have been persuaded against there will do not express their opinion on this issue. Dale Carnegie Charles is an engineer, and he communicates with other engineers at work, so he is used to using technical terminology. Now imagine that he has to make a report to the economic department of companies in order to provide financing for a new technical project. It depends not on the audience, but on Charles, whether his words reach the addressee. In this case, he needs to be able to explain technical problems in simple words accessible to people who do not have a technical education. But if a special term cannot be dispensed with, Charles must certainly explain it to the audience, and if necessary repeat the explanation. Speak clearly and clearly. We've all had to listen to speakers who mumble to themselves, speak too fast or too slow, or have a strong accent. If you do not articulate the words, the meaning of the messages is distorted. 
At the same time, poor pronunciation is easy enough to improve. Body language. Our actions, even unconsciously, have a huge impact on the impression we make. Research in the field of social linguistics has shown that only 7% of the message transmitted from one person to another is expressed verbally. About 38% are expressed in the form of sound characteristics of intonation, stress, pauses, and so on. And as much as 55% of the messages are transmitted using visual signals, that is, body language. Pose. A person's posture is visible from afar, so our emotional perception registers it first of all. Unlike other elements of body language, the pose immediately catches the eye. Scientists have found that a person with the right posture is more popular, purposeful, confident, friendly, and intelligent. At first, correct posture will seem uncomfortable and even unnatural. Therefore, constantly monitor the position of your body. Smiling, you tell that you like the other person, at least from happiness, and, in turn, cause positive emotions in the interlocutor. Therefore, develop the habit of smiling. Dale Carnegie A smile is the most influential of all facial expressions. Thanks to her, you can draw attention to your point of view. A smile almost always causes a response smile. This is not imitation, because it evokes a sense of human warmth and well-being. But an unnatural smile is worse than no smile. Don't try to smile warmly with just your mouth. The whole face is involved in a real smile. Eye contact. A direct look implies confidence, honesty and interest in the interlocutor. Lack of eye contact is usually perceived as a sign of fear, dishonesty, hostility, or boredom. Studies have shown that during job interviews, candidates give more complete answers to the questions posed if eye contact is maintained with them. The ability of students to understand and memorize the material presented by the teacher also depends on this factor. However, you should not look intently into the eyes of the interlocutor. It is necessary to cover the whole face with a glance. The telecast of the message. We receive information through the five senses. Most of the data our brain receives through hearing and vision, that is, through audio and video channels. Our era is the era of television, where audio and video merged into a single whole. No matter what we watch, whether it's Sesame Street or the daily newscasts, information comes to us simultaneously through our eyes and through our ears. This approach should also be applied to our communication with other people in order to convey our thoughts to them more effectively. Show me, not tell me. While training her employees, Joan found that she understands her much faster and better if she draws a diagram of sequential actions in the process of explaining. Steve realized from bitter personal experience that explaining to a person how to do a job is not everything. In order for the trainees to really understand what was required of them, he had to take them around the warehouses of the department store and explain the situation on the ground. It took a lot of time, so Steve developed a warehouse model. Many managers have a board on which they draw diagrams that make the presentation incomparably more effective. The combination of oral and visual information helps to remember what was said much better. Your task. Make listeners see, hear, and feel the same as you. The best way to achieve this. Clearly and vividly state the important details. Dale Carnegie. One of the most popular professors of the Faculty of Journalism at Syracuse University was a good cartoonist. During his lectures, he drew comics and cartoons. Colleagues made fun of him, believing that it was unprofessional. He does not teach, but only entertains, they said. Indeed, it amused the students. But at the same time, they memorized much more information than at a regular lecture, and for many years. Creating visual images on the phone. Phone number. This is a means of communication, when using which we cannot apply visual reasoning. But we are able to help the listener see what we have said. To do this, you need to draw verbal pictures. For example, we were asked to explain how to get to our office. We say, take the I-95 highway to Mulberry Street, turn right and go to the 4th traffic light. This will be 17th Avenue. Turn left there, and in 12 blocks there will be Smith Road. 
then turn right and drive five blocks. Our address is Smith Road, 2345. Is everything clear? And now we will describe the same path using verbal pictures. Take the I-95 highway to Mulberry Street, turn right and go to the fourth traffic light. There will be a gas station on the left, a McDonald's on the right. This is 17th Avenue. Turn left and soon you will see a fire station. This will be Smith Road. Then turn left and drive until a yellow brick building appears on the left side. This is our office, 2345 Smith Road. Isn't it easier this way? The visitor does not need to count the blocks, it is enough just to find the places of turns described by you. We draw a picture of the future. Successful sellers skillfully use verbal pictures. Audrey, a computer salesman, discussing the problems of a potential buyer, realized that one of his main problems was a mess in the office. Papers and folders are everywhere, the client complained. It is impossible to find anything. Every time I have to review mountains of folders. After describing the technical aspects of the new computers to the client, Audrey said, imagine your office six months later. There are no piles of papers on the tables and chairs. Everyone works on computers. When you need a particular folder, you type its name on the keyboard, and the necessary information immediately appears on the monitor. Audrey drew a verbal picture of the future. The client does not need to have a lot of imagination to imagine this picture and realize the full benefits of the purchase. Barriers to communication. No matter how good the preparation and the presentation itself are, sometimes the listener perceives what is said in a distorted form. The reason. The emergence of barriers that hinder communication. Many of them are not physical, but psychological in nature. We can choose words wisely and have perfect pronunciation, but problems of an immaterial nature often arise on the way to full-fledged communication. Different beliefs and attitudes that make up the emotional baggage of each of the parties. What does the interlocutor know? When discussing a particular problem with someone, we assume that the interlocutor knows the same about it as we do. But is it so? Assuming that the listener has information that he does not really have, you will not be able to adequately convey your idea to him. Watch out for your position. Another barrier that arises in the way of full-fledged communication is the positions of both sides. For example, if a manager is arrogant enough, then he can address subordinates as if from top to bottom. This causes resentment in people and seriously hinders communication. The message must not only be understood, but also accepted by the listening party. Only in this case it will reach the addressee. Where resentment arises, acceptance is unlikely. If a subordinate is outraged and offended by the position of the head, he does not perceive what has been said. Real leaders, when communicating with subordinates, try to avoid sarcastic and arrogant remarks. Beware of bias. People tend to hear what they want to hear. Information received on this topic earlier may distort the messages. If the new information differs from the previous one, that is, expected, they may be rejected as incorrect. In this case, it is not a new message that is being listened to, but one that is sent by the listener's own brain. It is necessary to learn to keep your mind open, objectively evaluate new information, and not block it just because it differs from what you heard earlier. When communicating with people, try to take into account the possibility that they have a biased opinion. If we are talking about your employees, then you may already know their point of view on this or that issue. Therefore, when expressing your opinion, it should be taken into account. Prepare for the fact that if the interlocutor's point of view differs from yours, you will have to overcome certain obstacles. Prejudices and prejudices, one's own and others. Listeners' prejudice against the speaker greatly influences the content of what they hear. If we respect the speaker, if we like him, we listen to him more attentively and accept his ideas more readily. Conversely, we tend to reject the ideas of those we don't like. Perception. This is a real process taking place in the listener's brain. Our attitude to the situation and the attitude to the person with whom we communicate should correspond to each other. Otherwise, misunderstandings cannot be avoided. Carol is the company controller. Her task. 
Cost reduction. If someone raises the question of the need to increase costs, Carol immediately takes it with hostility, even if the proposal is associated with a long-term benefit for the enterprise. To convince Carol, it is necessary to prove to her that a short-term increase in expenses will lead to long-term savings. Many do not even realize that they have certain prejudices. Analyze why you made this or that decision in the past. To what extent did your prejudices affect him? Use the following analysis scheme for this. Be aware of your biases. Think about why you're holding on to them. Recognize their characteristics. Forget about prejudice. Open your mind to objective information. Try to evaluate other people's ideas objectively. Don't let negative experiences revive your prejudices. Be aware of your emotional state. Everyone has bad days. Imagine that one of these days a colleague comes to you with an amazing new idea. How will you react? It is possible that so. I have enough problems without him. Who needs all this? When our mind is closed, the message is not perceived. It is important not only to be aware of your emotional status at the time of receiving or transmitting information. It is necessary to take into account the emotional status of the subordinate. For example, we discussed new projects with two colleagues. Dan and Joan. Joan was enthusiastic about the idea, Dan was skeptical. Why? Dan is annoyed because he is busy with another project and wants to focus on it completely. He believes that it is irrational to load him with additional work. A short conversation with the employees about their current affairs would make it clear how busy Dan is right now. When giving a new assignment, it would be necessary to emphasize the importance of the work that he is currently doing, praise him for his success and explain that the new task will not only not interfere with the old one, but will also help in its implementation. Interference in communication channels is one of the main sources of interference in communication. The path that the message passes from the speaker to the listener. In many large organizations, communication takes place within pre-established channels. The longer they are, the higher the probability of interference. A classic example. A game of a broken phone. One of the participants whispers something in the ear of the second, the second, the third, and so on. When the circle is completed, and the word reaches the first speaker, it is already distorted beyond recognition. So it is in the organization. Oral information is often distorted. One way to avoid interference is to provide information in writing. What is written is more difficult to distort, although the interpretation during its transmission may vary at different stages. This method has certain disadvantages. Firstly, not everything can be expressed in a letter. Secondly, it requires some time. For urgent information and information of short-term importance, written messages are not suitable. A more effective way to deal with interference is to reduce the length of channels and create workarounds where possible. The fewer stations on the way, the lower the probability of distortion. The main reason for the availability of channels is the need to fully inform all project participants. But it should not be exaggerated here. Channels are important when it comes to the main business. However, a significant part of communications in firms concerns routine issues. Transmitting them through channels means not only the danger of distortion, but also slower work. Feedback One of the main problems is that it is difficult for us to see ourselves from the outside. Research shows that we often treat ourselves much more critically than others treat us. At the same time, we may not realize that many things in our behavior should be changed. Here are some ways to get an accurate idea of your communication style. Watching videos of their speeches at meetings, repeating the speech in front of the mirror, attracting honest critics from the inner circle. Careful observation of the audience's reaction. A good idea is to find a coach who would help solve the identified problems. It can be a personal instructor or a seminar. How to properly assign work One of the main tasks of a manager or a mid-level manager is to assign work to his team. Bosses often complain, I don't understand why subordinates can't do my tasks. I give them clear instructions, and they still do everything wrong. Perhaps it's not the stupid employees at all, 
but the inability of the boss to effectively entrust the work. We are planning a task. As we have already said, the message needs to be thought through. However, many managers save time on preparing assignments. They know exactly what needs to be done, and assume that it is only necessary to give an order to a subordinate, and everything will be ready. Planning begins with creating a clear concept of what needs to be done. Even if you have already done similar work many times, it is important to think it over again. If the project is not familiar to you, then what should you do? Create a list of what goals need to be achieved. What information might be needed for this? What materials, tools, and so on are needed? A very important aspect of planning is to decide who will be assigned to do the work. When selecting people, take into account the specifics of the task. If it needs to be done quickly, choose people who are able to act actively and independently. If you have the opportunity to support an employee, it makes sense to entrust the work to less qualified people and use the project as a training to improve the level of professionalism of subordinates. We give the task. Barbara is upset. She told Carol in detail about what needed to be done, she assured her that everything was clear to her, and a week later it turned out that she had done everything wrong. I thought I should, Carol said. Norman was upset. The boss has just said an absolutely unrealistic, from Norman's point of view, deadline for completing the task. He doesn't understand anything, Norman thought. How can I do so much work in such a short time? Okay, I'll do what I can, but I'm sure it won't work. As we have already emphasized, the manager must make sure that the subordinate fully understood and accepted the task. We are drawing up an action plan. If the task requires a significant amount of time, ask the subordinate to draw up an action plan before starting work. It should include the following items. What needs to be done, by what date, what kind of support may be needed. Rita was tasked with making travel plans for 20 sales representatives to the conference. Before starting work, she compiled a list of actions in which all aspects of the task were noted, notify sales representatives, book airline tickets and hotel seats, deliver airline tickets to conference participants. The plan included the deadlines for completing all stages of the task, as well as the possible need for assistance at each of them. After analyzing this list together with her boss, Rita ensured herself against possible misunderstandings and problems even before starting work. Please note that Rita has made a plan in writing. Thus, both she and the boss were able to monitor its implementation and solve emerging problems. We control the execution of the task. No matter how well the task is planned, the boss has the responsibility from time to time to monitor its implementation in accordance with the plan. Alan is sure that if he controls his subordinates too often, they will have the feeling that he does not trust them. I want my subordinates to be real participants in the case, partners. Having accepted their plan of action, I assume that they will carry it out. If I constantly monitor them, I will introduce dissonance into our work. Alan is right in many ways, but he bears the main responsibility for the success of his department. Control is necessary to ensure that tasks are completed. In addition, it can be controlled in such a way that people do not have the feeling that they are not trusted. The basis of Alan's management philosophy is partnership. Therefore, he should also exercise control within the framework of a partnership. Do not look over your shoulder, do not shock people with sudden checks, but include control in the action plan at various stages of the task. After completing one of the stages, the subordinate meets with Alan to discuss what has been done. They should be ready to make critical comments and suggestions in the future project. Thus, control becomes part of the partnership approach and encourages the subordinate to achieve even greater success in completing the task. Diplomacy and Tact Our way of communicating can generate both positive and negative emotions. By acting aggressively and disrespectfully, we cause people to feel angry and defensive. Naturally, in this case they will not hear what we are trying to tell them. Effective communication is impossible without diplomacy and tact. In order for the interlocutor to feel comfortable, it is necessary to adapt your communication style to him. 
There are four main communication styles. Friendly style. The people to whom it is peculiar behave naturally and friendly. They are focused on interpersonal relationships and are always ready to help. Such people do not like to argue and count on positive feedback. Analytical style Those who are characterized by such a style are formal, methodical, and systematic. They operate with data and details, carefully evaluate the facts and find answers and solutions based on them. Expressive style The people to whom it is peculiar are very emotional. They tend to use gestures. They are more interested in the big picture than the details, and are concerned about what benefits they will personally receive from the project. Pragmatic style. Those who are characterized by such a goal-oriented style, even if they are firmly convinced of something, they still consider the opinion of others. The goals of diplomatic and tactful communication. Establish a mutual connection, taking into account the style of communication of the interlocutor. Use a suitable language that corresponds to the style of communication of the interlocutor, do not rush, do not rush the interlocutor, take into account his pace of communication. How to establish trust. Full-fledged communication is impossible without trust and respect from colleagues and subordinates. To establish trust, it is necessary to take care of the interests of others, find out what motivates them, and help them grow and learn. Listen carefully. Ears, eyes, and heart, without judgment and prejudice. Respect the opinions of others and find positive aspects in the difference of views. Involve people in decision-making, be open to new ideas. Be ready for negotiations and compromises, act as an intermediary between people with different points of view. Think before you speak, choosing words and actions, take into account the characteristics of the audience. Communicate diplomatically, respectfully, and tactfully. Speak confidently, clearly and authoritatively, expressing an opinion, convincingly substantiate it. Defend your core beliefs and values. Be ready to agree with the opinions and experiences of others. Be a reliable person, be able to keep secrets, fulfill promises and obligations. Refrain from mood swings, act consistently, rationally, fairly, ethically and honestly. Be an example of professionalism for others. Show trust in others, share your thoughts, demonstrate the coincidence of words and deeds. Be accessible to people. Set realistic goals. Admit your mistakes. To act openly, not to gossip, not to discuss the person behind his back. To share success, to recognize the contribution of others to the achievement of a common cause. Let's summarize the results. When preparing to present your ideas in front of a group of people or in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, think over your speech. Speak clearly and clearly, with enthusiasm, so that the audience is constantly in an active state. Control your body language. Be prepared to overcome barriers to full communication. Be aware of your prejudices and try to get rid of them. When assigning a task to others, explain in detail and clearly what needs to be done. Get feedback on whether what you have said is clear. Monitor the execution of the task. Make sure that what you have said is not only understood, but also accepted by the other side. Be tactful and diplomatic in dealing with people. Chapter 2 The Art of Conversation The ability to have an interesting conversation is one of the most valuable personal qualities. It is useful both in business and in personal life. Being a pleasant conversationalist means making a positive impression on people, especially those with whom we are not familiar enough. The ability to interest a person, to attract his attention, is an undeniable advantage, among other things, helping to find and keep friends. This ability opens doors and warms hearts, makes us interesting in any company, provides a flow of customers, helps to achieve success. It is a tool that convinces people to accept our ideas, follow them, and buy our products. People who have mastered the art of conversation, who know how to interest others, have a significant advantage over those who, perhaps, know more, but do not know how to present their knowledge in an attractive form. There is great power in the ability to conduct a conversation. The one who speaks without thinking, 
does not know how to express his thoughts clearly and concisely, acts against himself. Chatter and gossip does not make a proper impression. Nothing says more about your refinement or rudeness, about good manners or lack thereof, than your style of conversation. He will tell you everything about you. What we say and how we say it will reveal all our secrets, will present us in the true light. There are four and only four ways to establish contact with the outside world. We are evaluated and classified based on what we do, how we look, what we say and how we say it. Dale Carnegie What does it mean to be a good conversationalist? Intelligence and professionalism are useful things, but they do not help a good speaker to attract the attention of listeners. People should feel your sincerity, see that you empathize with them. One should not greet people coldly. Our good afternoon or glad to meet you should reflect genuine interest. Look the other person straight in the eye. Do not forget about a sincere smile and kind words. Then people will want to meet you again. Show cordiality. If you want to become a good conversationalist, you should learn to be cordial. Open your heart. Those who only open the door to their hearts say to others, you can look in, but you will not enter until I find out whether it is worth dealing with you. Unfortunately, a lot of people are stingy with cordiality. They leave it for a special occasion for close friends, not wanting to share it with everyone. Don't be afraid to open your heart. Don't meet people as if you're afraid of making a mistake. A warm, friendly handshake and a cordial greeting will immediately endear a person to you. He will say to himself, Oh, this is a really interesting person, and I want to get to know him better. It looks like he saw something in me that most people don't see. Learn to greet people cordially and openly. This will create a real miracle. Tension, distrust and indifference will disappear literally before our eyes. People will understand that they are interesting to you. Benevolence makes a real revolution in communication and attracts people to us. It's not what we say that matters, but how we do it. Do not forget that we speak not only with words, but also with intonation, facial expression, gestures, and posture. Charles Eliot, president of Harvard University, said, I believe that the main feature of education is the ability to use the native language subtly. No skill, no knowledge brings such benefits as the ability to conduct a refined conversation. Learn to speak beautifully. Most of us do not have enough command of speech, because they do not want to learn to speak beautifully, read and think a little. Many speak sloppy language because it's easier that way. No need to think before you say it, no need to try to speak elegantly and naturally. Bad interlocutors always find an excuse for their unwillingness to improve the art of speech. A good speaker should be born. But in the same way you can say that you need to be born a good lawyer, doctor, businessman. No one has ever become an excellent specialist without a lot of work. Labor. This is the payment for any achievement. The ability to interest people, to captivate them is a great power. The one who has knowledge, but is not able to present it in a logical and interesting way, always loses. It is a great pleasure to listen to a person who can speak beautifully. His speech flows so smoothly and clearly, he chooses words with such taste and precision, his pronunciation is so perfect that he enchants everyone who listens to him. There are different situations in life. And you may be poor, unable to go to college, study music or art. But nothing can prevent you from becoming an interesting conversationalist. Every book you read, every person you meet, if he knows how to speak beautifully, can help you. Few people think about how he speaks. People pronounce the first words that come to their mind without trying to formulate a sentence so that the speech is beautiful, concise and clear. Reading is not only a source of new knowledge and ideas, it expands our vocabulary. Sometimes a person has brilliant ideas, but because of the poverty of the lexicon, he is not able to express them. He talks and talks, repeating himself endlessly. And all because he does not find the necessary word. Anyone who wants to learn how to speak beautifully should communicate with cultured, educated people. Isolating yourself from others, even if you have a college degree in your pocket, 
you will not become good conversationalists. We all sympathize with shy people who painfully try to say something, but can't. Shy young people, students and students often suffer terribly from the inability to express their thoughts. But the same thing happened to great speakers when they first tried to speak to the public. There is only one way to master the art of speech, to constantly train, learn, including from your own mistakes, to express your thoughts effectively and elegantly. It happens that as soon as you start talking, the thought disappears, you stumble and helplessly try to find the right words. It doesn't matter. With each attempt, you are getting closer to the goal and next time it will be easier for you to speak. You will be surprised how quickly you manage to overcome shyness and awkwardness. Only, I repeat, the main thing is not to stop, not to stop trying. All good speakers, speaking to an audience, experience an inspiring surge of strength and energy. The contact of mind with mind, thoughts with thought generate new energy, like two chemicals, interactions between each other generate a third. Sincerely interested in people. By being interested in people, you can achieve more in two months than in two years of trying to get others to be interested in you. Dale Carnegie Many of us are not only bad speakers, but also bad listeners. We are too impatient. Instead of completely immersing ourselves in the perception of speech, we look around, draw little men, swing on a chair and interrupt the speaker, not allowing him to complete his thought. In fact, we are so impatient that we don't have time for anything other than elbowing others. We are bored by everything that does not expand our business, does not bring money, does not help us to take the desired position. We do not enjoy socializing with friends, but look at them as if they are steps on a ladder, and evaluate them depending on whether they send us new customers. One of the reasons for the inability to be a good conversationalist is the inability to empathize. We are too selfish, too concerned about our own well-being, too immersed in our own world to be interested in others. But without being able to empathize, it is impossible to become a good conversationalist. If you want people to like you, you must be able to enter into their lives, and also take into account their interests. No matter how well you own the topic, but if it does not interest those to whom you speak, your efforts will be in vain. How sad it is sometimes to see people lost in the lobby or club and unable to engage in conversation because they are too immersed in themselves, in their thoughts. They miss the opportunity to wholeheartedly enter into the lives of others and learn to be good speakers. They are cold and reserved. Their thoughts are somewhere else. They are only interested in two things, their own business and their own world. As soon as we talk about these two things, they immediately show interest, but at the same time we are completely indifferent to them. Such people do not care about our problems and successes. They will never offer to help us. They are not destined to become good conversationalists, because they are too closed and selfish. Be tactful. Good interlocutors are always very tactful. They show interest without hurting or insulting anyone. Lincoln, who had an amazing sense of humor, masterfully knew how to interest everyone he met. In his presence, people felt at home and fully opened up. They were willing to talk with Lincoln, because he always treated the interlocutor very cordially and gave him more than he received from him. Have a sense of humor like Lincoln. A huge help for the speaker. But, firstly, not everyone can be funny, and secondly, you can't imitate a sense of humor. A person trying to pretend to be funny looks ridiculous. And yet good conversationalists are not too serious. They do not overload us with the smallest details, but complement the facts with illustrations or anecdotes. Too serious a conversation can cause boredom, but excessive lightness can also do harm. What entertains is not always conducive to achieving your goals. A good interlocutor should be direct, cheerful, natural and friendly. You can attract people's attention only by getting them interested, and you can do this only with the help of sincere friendly sympathy. Cold, detached people will not be able to hold anyone's attention for long. The impression you make will be an important success factor. Having learned how to convince and impress, you will already be halfway to victory. Remember the names. Remember that for a person, 
the sound of his name is the sweetest and most important sound of human speech. Dale Carnegie. Getting to know a new person for you, try to remember his name by all means. If it was not pronounced clearly, and this happens quite often, especially if it represents several people at once. Feel free to ask again. During the conversation, call the interlocutor by name. This will help you remember it better. Decide which part of the name you will use. Americans, for example, use mostly personal names, except when the interlocutor is much older or higher in position. Then the surname is used, for example, Mr. Johnson, until the interlocutor asks to call him by his first name. In other cultures, it is customary to always address a person as Mr. or use the title doctor, professor, unless the interlocutor asks to be less formal. Create a mental image that connects a person with his name. Think in images, not words. Imagine, for example, Julia standing in a jewelry store, and Tom with a thick book volume in his hands. Repeat the name of the person in the conversation, but do not abuse it, otherwise it will look fake. It is recommended about once every three to four minutes, as well as when saying goodbye. If the name of a new acquaintance matches the name of a friend or relative, imagine these people standing next to each other. The most important thing is to pronounce, pronounce, pronounce the name until it is remembered. Find out as much as possible about the interlocutor. When meeting a new person, it is important to learn as much as possible about him. Ask the interlocutor questions, but it should not be like an interrogation. A few well chosen questions. A great start to a conversation. When asking about something, you should be careful, because you don't want to seem intrusive and curious. The questions should be appropriate to the situation. In a conversation on business topics. Some, in the conversation about life, others. A good start to a conversation can be questions about where the interlocutor lives, what his hobbies and interests are, what school or college he went to, and so on. In a conversation on business topics, questions about the company that the interlocutor represents and about new products will be a good seed. Conversation styles. The impression you make on others is influenced by your manner of conducting a conversation. There are three main styles. Passive, aggressive, and affirmative. People who are prone to a passive style in conversation differ in the following qualities. They are more concerned about the problems of others, mainly to their own detriment. They are often internally tense, although this may be unnoticeable to others. They often have low self-esteem. They want to be liked more than to be respected. They advance others, even at their own expense. They would rather take the blame on themselves than blame others. They avoid confrontation. When it is necessary to act, they will not directly ask for it, but will express their opinion as a suggestion or a wish. The opposite of the passive style is aggressive. Aggressive people have the following qualities, they are focused exclusively on themselves, they are often internally tense. They lack positive self-esteem, but they don't admit it even to themselves. Usually they are liked by others and are not respected. Often humiliates others with sarcasm or derogatory comments. Trying to control everyone and everything. She puts the blame on others and is not ready to take responsibility for herself. They enjoy confrontation and always strive for it in conversation with people who have the opposite opinion. By taking a leading position, they force others to follow them. Prone to verbal abuse of opponents. When it is necessary to act, they give a command or make demands. Good conversationalists choose the golden mean between these extremes. They apply an affirmative style. Such people defend their rights, but at the same time they are sensitive to the problems of the interlocutor. They know how to manage stress. Have a positive self-esteem. Direct and honest. Enjoys the respect of others, takes responsibility for his mistakes, and expects the same from others. They do not seek confrontation, but try to convince the interlocutor of their rightness by conducting a frank objective discussion. Always ready to listen to the interlocutor. When it is necessary to act, they say what needs to be done and work together with others to achieve the goal. Changing yourself as a person is not so easy. 
but anyone who wants to become a good conversationalist should first determine their style of conversation. If it turns out that this is a passive or aggressive style, you need to try to develop a positive style of communication. Our identity is in the handset. Every time you talk on the phone, you leave the interlocutor with a certain opinion about yourself, and often the impression of this conversation will be the only one about you and your company. In a personal conversation, there are plenty of opportunities to make a good or bad impression. Facial expression, gestures, posture. Speaking on the phone, we have the only tool. By voice. As a rule, a person hears himself differently than others hear him. The best way to evaluate your voice. Record several phone conversations on tape, listen to them carefully and, if necessary, make changes. Our installations. Friendliness is one of the main characteristics of effective contact with other people. Does your voice sound friendly enough when recording phone conversations? Aren't you annoyed? Perhaps this call came at the wrong time, the boss is pressuring you, there is an unfulfilled task or a crisis in the department, but your interlocutor does not know anything about it. Therefore, you should learn to throw everything out of your head except for this phone conversation. If you are upset or upset about something, do not pick up the phone right away. First, take a deep breath, relax your muscles and try to clear your mind. Be calm and attentive, and then you will be able to make a good impression on the interlocutor. Tactics of answering calls answer the call right away. In a business situation, the phone should ring no more than three times. If you are talking on another phone at this time, put the first one on the answering machine or delay the current conversation by putting the phone on hold, pick up the phone and ask to wait a few minutes, or write down the phone number and call back later. If you are going to leave your workplace, put your phone on the answering machine or ask one of your colleagues to answer calls. Always say your name. Instead of hello, say, technical department, Sam Johnson. If the interlocutor is not familiar to you, ask for his name, if necessary, ask again how it is written, and fix it on paper. In conversation, call the interlocutor by name. It shows interest. If you can't find an answer to the question for several minutes, it's better to promise to call back than to make a person wait by the phone. If he agrees to wait, it is necessary to respond from time to time so that the person does not think that you have forgotten about him. Sometimes the caller to the company is informed that he is being connected to another person, and at this moment the connection is cut off. It's terribly annoying. If it is necessary to redirect a call, you should always inform the subscriber to whom it will be redirected and give that person's phone number. You can also ask for the phone number of the client and in case of a break in communication, call him. Answer not only direct questions, but also perceived problems. Martha called the mailing department to complain about a damaged parcel with the ordered goods. She was told that the goods must be returned to the post office. Martha was upset. She decided that she would have to go to the post office herself. Fortunately, an employee of the mailing department understood Martha's problem and explained to her that they would arrange with the post office and take the damaged parcel from Martha. The employee did not just calm the client down, he made her loyal to the company. Tactics of phone calls critical moments are the beginning and end of a phone conversation. At the beginning of the conversation, show the person that you are happy to talk to him. If you don't know him, introduce yourself, good morning, Mrs. Samuels. As a mother of children and school children, I understand your concern about the quality of education in our district. This is Blanche, the campaign manager of Diana McGrath, the candidate for president of the school board. End the conversation on a positive note. Thank you for your attention. I hope to meet you at the council meeting next Tuesday. Before you pick up the phone, schedule calls. Make a list of issues that need to be discussed in the conversation, and make notes of each of them. Follow this plan and the conversation will be more concise and effective. Listen carefully to the person. It may happen that his answers will force you to make changes to the original plan. Of course, it is necessary to listen to a person during a personal conversation, but during a telephone conversation this is especially important, since we cannot rely on nonverbal signals. Facial expression, 
gesture, and pose. Learn to detect changes in the intonation of the interlocutor. Small talk. There is nothing frivolous about small talk. An informal style of communication can become the basis for a long-term relationship. You don't have to be an expert on all current events. All that is required of you is to focus on the interlocutor's favorite topic and ask questions that arouse interest. Even a classic conversation about the weather can melt the ice in the relationship between people. Become a good listener. Questions are the first step to getting to know each other. But, no matter how well they are thought out, if we do not pay attention to the answers, we lose information. Both in person and on the phone, it is important to hone your listening skills. The effectiveness of the conversation. In order for the conversation to be effective, it is necessary to adhere to the following rules. Smile. A smile is important even in a telephone conversation, because it affects the intonation of the voice. If necessary, start with a light conversation about trifles. This will break the ice between you and the interlocutor. Remember the name of the person and call him by his first name. Establish a connection with the interlocutor, noting his successes and achievements. Find a common theme. Show respect for the interlocutor and the time spent by him. Try to avoid questions leading to confrontation. Demonstrate a sincere desire to learn as much as possible about the interlocutor by asking him meaningful questions. Listen carefully to the speaker. Offer him help. Tell the person the information he is interested in, which he may not know yet. Sincerely praise the interlocutor, compliment him. Let's summarize the results. The necessary conditions for an effective conversation. Prepare for the conversation. Hone your conversation skills, stay up to date with the latest trends and latest developments. Remember the name of the person and call him by his first name. Maintain eye contact with the interlocutor. This will indicate that you are listening to him carefully. However, you should not stare the interlocutor directly in the eyes. It is necessary to cover the whole face with a glance. Speak clearly and clearly. If you are constantly asked to repeat what has been said, it means that your speech is illegible. Record the conversation on a tape recorder and listen to the recording. Contact a specialist to solve problems with voice or diction. Use words and images familiar to listeners. Consider the interlocutor's style of speech. With colleagues at work, some words and expressions are appropriate, with teenagers on the street others. Keep within the framework of the chosen topic. You should not constantly change the topic of conversation. It will ruin him. Do you know when to talk and when to listen? Conversation means receiving and receiving information. Each of its participants needs to speak out, everyone needs to listen. Participate in the conversation, but don't monopolize it. Take an interest in what has been said. At the appropriate moment, show interest by nodding to comments or questions. Stimulate the conversation with questions for which a simple yes or no is not enough to answer. What should not be done to make the conversation effective? Don't talk not too fast, not too slow. Some people pronounce words so quickly that sometimes it is impossible to catch them at all, and some pronounce them so slowly that listeners forget what they are talking about. Don't mumble or swallow words. Don't speak not too softly, not too loudly. The volume of your voice should depend on the distance to the interlocutor. Don't monopolize the conversation. Let others speak out. Don't brag. Conversation. This is an exchange of ideas and opinions, not a manifestation of selfishness. Do not interrogate the interlocutor. Ask questions in a calm, benevolent tone. Don't interrupt. Let the person express his thought to the end. Interrupting is not just impolite, we may miss the meaning of what others have said. Don't close your mind. This is necessary to understand the point of view of other people. Dear listeners, write down what other books you would like to listen to in audio format. Thank you for your likes and comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We wish you all the best.